so a starter for you today while we wait for other people to join us we're thinking a little bit about labeling today so you are correct if you're thinking we are going to look at interactionalism as a perspective those that look at how we interact with each other and how we label each other and the effects of labels so i want you to start by having a look at these four boxes of stories about individual people and i just want you to jot down into your books what label you think society might give those people could be one label could be a little um, two or three labels you could bullet point you could write a sentence but what image what label would society have of these people so the first one the yellow box Steve is a former soldier from the Falklands War. During his time in the war, he saved two of his fellow soldiers from an ambush and was rewarded with the Victoria Cross following the war. Since his time in the war, he suffered from mental health issues and PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder. This has caused him to become addicted to his medication and he has started to develop other addictions. So in your books for Steve, what is society going to say about him? How would they label him? Now let's look at Mary. Mary works for a university as a scientist. She has spent 40 years doing this job and is really popular part of the community. Recently she was involved in a hit and run car accident where she accidentally hit somebody with their car. Luckily they survived. Mary was found guilty and lost her driving license and fined money. She has since been rewarded for her work in helping develop new treatments for epilepsy. Then we've got Katrina. Katrina is an unemployed single mother with three children. She relies heavily on benefits to support her children and has given up trying to get a paid job because she's been rejected by lots of companies. However, during the day, while her children are at school, she volunteers at a local care home, looking after the elderly people who live there. And then finally, we've got Ian. Ian is a cashier at the local supermarket. He likes his job, he gets to talk to lots of different people and his customers really praise him for being friendly and helpful. Ian was involved in a lot of trouble with his mates when they were younger, part of a deviant subculture. Bonus points if you can tell me in the chat what we mean by deviant subculture. Using weapons against each other. He's well known in the gang for breaking into people's homes and stealing. So have a look at those. Jot down the labels or, or label that you think society would give those four individuals. Tell us about it. Press pause. Title for today then, I hinted in the starter, the title today is all around interactionalism. So that's your title, interactionalism and crime. And remember, whenever we're talking about interactionalism, we're essentially talking about labelling. So what we are looking at today is the impact on la of labelling on crime rates. How being labelled affects a person, affects a criminal, affects a criminal potentially re-offending and staying in the pattern of criminal behaviour and also looking at some of the stereotypical views towards criminals so um, what people generally think a criminal might look like so there are very strong stereotypes about what a criminal is like and these are often exaggerated I'm going to get you to put that to the test in just a moment but a lot of people have an idea of what they think a typical offender might look like when they think and they hear the word criminal or offender, they immediately think of a particular characteristic or set of characteristics about the person. And these stereotypes are passed on through the media and through other agents of socialisation. So your peer group and your family speak to you, speak with you about what it is like and what it looks like to be a criminal. So key words here for your glossary for you to write down in the back of your books. We've got stereotypes first of all so a stereotype we know is a simplified view of a person or a group that is often exaggerated and it can lead to discrimination and then we've got typical offender the image of a certain type of person who commits a crime so the first thing i actually want you to do is to draw an outline of a figure and then turn that outline into what you think is a typical offender so i want you to draw a criminal Take four or five minutes to do this and think about what they, you think they'd look like, what they might wear, what they might have on their person in terms of accessories. Spend some time doing that. Press pause. So who are these typical offenders then? Let's have a little look at these typical offenders. So when um, we put criminal into Google search, for example, this is what we get. 
So first of all, some time to think about what do you notice. So again, I'd like you to press pause and just have a think. What do you notice about these people? What common characteristics do they share? And what they share is exactly what sociologists would say the typical offender is. And this is what I need you to just jot down this bottom bit here. That they say, sociologists say, that the typical offender is young, male, and often working class. Now, it's difficult necessarily to spot the class there, um, although I would suggest that they do mostly look like your typical stereotype, again, of working class. But you can certainly see the majority there are quite young, and every single one of them, interestingly, is male. So interaction lists. We've talked about interaction lists before, and we know that they are all about labelling and how labels affect people's interactions with each other. So we talked about this a lot, if you remember, when we did the education unit and we looked at how students are labelled, particularly, for example, students in bottom sets might be labelled as being less um, academic, less interested in school and so on. And so they are treated a certain way by the teacher. Or we might look at things like the working class being labelled as less interested in school, less able to do um, academic work and perhaps labelled as going to be the types of people that have manual labour jobs in the future and therefore they are judged purely and simply on the label they are given as opposed to being judged by their academic ability for example or the skills that they might have. So it's the same thing here, interactionists look at criminal labelling and they say there's no such thing as a typical offender and that anybody can be a criminal, there is no typicality. And they say also, and this is a really important key word here, that if a person is labelled a criminal, it's really hard to shake that label off. And it becomes what's known as their master status. So in other words, the thing they are most known for, their master status. So they are most known for being a criminal. So you can see this lady here. Obviously, this is, is um, not how you would walk around. But the thing she is known for, first and foremost, is being a thief. So master status, a word for your um, glossary, the most recognisable label a person has. So it stops becoming about whether they are a mother or a daughter or a father or a doctor or a postman or a police officer. It doesn't matter all of those things about who they are, working class, middle class, male, female. The most important thing about them becomes that they are a criminal. And that's really, really, really hard for them to get away from. So why? Why do you think it's really hard to get away from that label? Let's have a conversation about that, please. You write some bits and pieces in your book if you're doing this on your own or if you're doing it in the lesson, but remotely write down into the group chat why that might be. Why do you think it is hard to shake off this label? Once you're labelled as a criminal, why is it really hard to shake off this master status label? So final thing to talk about is what are the effects of the labelling? So we've got some questions down the side here and we've got a graph here. So if we look at the graph first of all, this is down here tells you the number of cautions and sentencing occasions people have had. So it goes up in hundreds of thousands and this is how many people have been cautioned or sentenced for a crime. And then along here we've got the year. In the blue is people getting sentenced or cautioned for their first crime. In the red is people getting sentenced or cautioned for second, third, fourth, fifth, however many crimes they've done, but re-offending. And then here is the total of the two put together. So questions. In 2001, how many people, 2011 apologies, how many people in England and Wales were charged with their first offence? How many people were charged for re-offending? And then what is the trend over the past 10 years? And why do you think this is? Why do you think that we've got this situation going on here? So press pause and have a go. I am going to answer the first three questions just to help you out so that you can do question number four if you're working at home on your own. So, 2011, how many people in England Wales first offence? We've got around about 180,000, this figure down here. By the time we come up here, we've got re-offending rates of about 580,000. And what's happening to the trend? So overall, you can see the trend is going down. Less people are being charged with criminal offences. Less people are doing their first crimes 
Well, we've only really got a levelling off of um, further offences. So what that's telling us is that less people perhaps are turning to crime in the first place, but that those already who are criminals are going on to reoffend again and again. So I go back to question number four. Why do you think this is? And that's what I want you to consider with a paragraph in your books. So that takes us to the end of this lesson for today. We will start looking at something called deviant career next. And those two words are a bit of a hint to question number four. Thank you for listening.